Good morning, sunshine. Welcome to our show based on behavioral health. I'm your host, Brandon Lee, alongside my very good friend and colleague, Carrie Pena. Thank you all so much for being with us. What's going down at this very moment? We're keeping an eye on uh, Mental Health ABC Act. Okay. And it's called different things in different states. But what this is really doing is addressing the barrier to care and putting mental health care on the same level as physical health care. It is so crucial that, that this country finally is paying attention to people's behavioral health and mental health. It's so crucial uh, that we focus on not just the physical, but also the mental. Arizona has been on the forefront of this. We've been uh, Arizona folks here to Access. We're gonna be having some folks from Access on today. They really have made mental health care a priority for them. So it's finally good to see other states across the country catching up to what we're doing here in Arizona. And we should say uh, Access has done a really terrific job uh, working so hard behind the scenes to make this topic uh, something that people pay attention to. And this includes annual uh, mental health exams, increasing access to community-based and recovery-based programs. And this is uh, something that could really change the game. And we definitely want to hear from our audience on this topic, so make sure you share your thoughts in the comment section. Tell us what you think about uh, breaking down this barrier to care, how uh, folks are doing across the country, and what you think could be done better, because we want to hear from you, of course. All right, I am so excited for this next segment. Um, it is our story behind the story. Her name is Tara Sundam. She is the founder, the CEO of an incredible program here in the Valley called Hushabai Nursery. You guys are dealing with um, helping babies who are, who are being born, right, yeah. oftentimes being exposed to drugs. And it's really important that we qualify this because many of the mothers that you're dealing with, they're not currently drug addicts. They may have been drug addicts in their past, but their doctors have prescribed them drugs like methadone so that they can be super high functioning, be the good mom that they need yeah. to be. But when you're a mom and you are on methadone, even though it's subscribed by your doctor and you're pregnant, your baby will be exposed to those drugs when they're born. Absolutely. And you used to work in the NICU, you decided what they were doing wasn't, you didn't think was really working in the way it right. could be, the best way, mm -hmm. and you opened Hush by Nursery. How are you helping these babies exposed to drugs? We're just making it easier. We're caring for the babies the way that you and I would want our babies cared for, in a quiet, dark environment, um, with one-to-one -one caregivers. If the pacifier falls out, Someone's there immediately to put it back in. If they start to fuss, it's like, hold them. Um, babies that are going through that withdrawal process, process it's painful. Um, I had one mom like really dumb it down for me, explaining to me that withdrawal was like the worst flu and migraine times 100. And I went, oh my gosh, that's exactly what we see with babies. I, I mean, they can't sleep, fever, chills. Um, irritability, vomiting, diarrhea, it's hard to watch. And believe me, when you see one baby withdrawal, you'll never, ever forget it. And they can do really well um, in that perfect environment. And we're showing it. We're showing that, you know, not necessarily do they need pharmacological support. Sometimes they do. But if you put them in the environment of Hush by Nursery um, with trauma-informed caregivers, with no stigma, they're going to really invite families there. Babies do best with their moms and dads. When my kids were sick, they did not want me dropping them off at daycare. They wanted me. And babies, when they're withdrawing, they want their, ba they want their moms and their dads, whoever can help them. You were on my podcast a few years <clears throat> back <throat> as you were first developing this idea. Yeah. Because you, as Brandon mentioned, you know, you were a NICU nurse. Uh -huh. And basically you said, this isn't working. Right. Uh, these babies are in an environment that's too bright, too loud, and, and you would often have to take them somewhere else, yeah. correct? Yeah. To try to get in them the to closet. calm down. We in the closet. Did. Yeah. We did. So as you've built this, you know, um, so what are some of the things that you're providing? Like when you swaddle mm -hmm. them. And I know you have volunteers who are volunteers yeah. to just come in mm -hmm. and rock them. Yep. Yep, we do therapeutic techniques, so not just the environment, but when you hold a baby, usually when they're, when they're crying, you would do this bounce, and that's just what you do. Well, it does something with the ears, and that's just irritable. Instead, when you're holding a baby that's withdrawing, sometimes you, know, you put them chest to chest. Sometimes that's too much for them. You actually turn them away from you, make them look at a blank wall, so there's no extra stimulation. And instead of doing that bounce, bounce, you're doing this elevator motion. So you're going up and down fast. 
and it helps them either calm enough so they can burp or toot, mm -hmm. but they get rid of that gas that's hurting their tummies, and then you see them just all of a sudden go, okay, I can do this. And they usually, you're holding them like this, and you feel them just slump over, and it's like, okay, you guys, are their eyes closed? And as soon as their eyes are closed, it's like, okay, now I'm gonna sit down, and I'm gonna just sit here for a long time. And if we can get them through doing that, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of attention. Um, sometimes it's really hard. I mean, I'll be in there and I'm like, okay, I need to tap out. Yeah. What are some who of the can hardest be there? things, like for people don't know, who don't know, like what is it like when a baby is going through withdrawals? What, describe that to us, because I can only imagine how mm -hmm. traumatic that must be to witness. Yeah, yeah. Um, probably the shakes or the, the tremors are probably the thing that you see most, and then the high-pitched cat cry. So that doesn't stop. And so it's like, okay, I can't get them to be quiet. What do I do? It's hard. And, and even with us being, I would say, experts, um, we get to that point. I mean, it will be like, okay, next nurse, you try. If someone is in the NICU, they're there for an average of how long? 21 to 22 days is national average. 21 to 22 days mm -hmm. that a baby exposed to drugs, go to the, you know, do a normal hospital, regular hospital, they're there for 21, 22 days. Mm -hmm. What is the cost of that stay for a family? Yeah. Anywhere from 2,400 to $3,200 a night. So 40 to $60,000. What is the average length of stay that a baby exposed to drugs, similar circumstances, and they go to Hushabai, the length of stay? Seven days. Seven days, what is the cost? Less than $1,000 a night. Less so than $1,000 a night, and what do parents pay out of their pocket? Nothing. Nothing. Yeah. I love the whole thing, so yep. thank you so much thank for coming you. on. Thank you, thank you, I so you. appreciate it. Yeah. And now I want to share out our inspired story of the day. I flew to Los Angeles to interview a transformational leader who is leading millions on a journey of manifestation and joy. Take a look. Field of Awakening is a four day live, but not virtual life, physical life process where people are in a room. And as the name means, it is a field that is created for awakening human beings. Mm -hmm. For when I say awakening from the prison wall of the mind. Every experience is had within the prison of the mind where there is a constant compulsive movement to a past or a future and not actually being alive and present to the moment. And life lived between the past and the future is not truly being alive. Mm -hmm. Does not allow you to connect to the situation, does not allow you to connect to the people. And a large part of human beings live one's life within the mind not truly being awake to reality. I would say it is probably one of the most incredible experience that a seeker can have. To move beyond the prison walls of the mind and to experience reality. When you say a seeker, can you explain? Somebody who feels, you know, life need not be lived within the mind. Life need not be lived in suffering. Life need not be this mundane. If you have to look at it as a spectrum, on one side of the spectrum is suffering state, where the experience of self is so limited. And the other side of the spectrum is feeling oneness, feeling one with all life, feeling one with nature, feeling the union with God or divine, however you want to call feeling union with the universe. That is the other side of the spectrum. When you live life feeling connected, these are experiences possible for human beings. These are experiences possible for the brain consciousness and being to have that experience. And when you live in those states, the actions, the words, the impact, is huge in terms of a positive impact we can create on this planet. Are there ever days where you're you're struggling and you have to remind yourself? When challenges do come, you're pushed into suffering. 
but then you don't stay there that is enlightenment when an external challenge happens that is a problem and when you internalize an external challenge it is suffering people live in that state of suffering for a very long time in stress in anxiety in fear our vision carry is to make sure that individuals can live free of suffering and we see that as being the only solution because from a suffering state one can only create more suffering from anger we can provoke more anger from sadness we can create more sadness from anxiety we can create more tension to live free of suffering is the vision for everybody who comes to us it's a vision because we believe that as being the solution for the problems of the world we appreciate her giving us that interview in the middle of a very busy day there at the field of awakening and now our mind body spirit segment and we are talking now to CJ Loisel who runs the crisis care programs for access here in Arizona. Thank you so much for coming in. We've wanted to have you on the show. <laughs> we put a request into your team some time ago. You're you're very busy and we appreciate you being here. It has been a very busy year, but we're very I'm very happy to be here. Very glad that you guys um, are helping bring some publicity to this very important topic. We want to dive right in. We're talking about the 988, which is the emergency number uh, for suicide hotline. Talk to us about that. So 988 is a dialing code um, that, that routes into what used to be the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. It is now 988 Suicide and Crisis Prevention. That's a big distinction. So uh, what has focused primarily on once you're in a suicidal crisis call is now moved into crisis. What triggers you, what it is, is very personal. You do not have to wait um, until you're in a state where you might lose your life to reach out for help. And that is modeled very much after what we've done here in Arizona for over three decades, really treating the whole person. So substance use disorder, family crisis, food insecurity, depression, loneliness, those things lead up to suicidal ideation. And we wanna make sure that we're getting that first touch, first opportunity to save a life before it's too late. I want to share something with you. Um, it's from personal lived experience. Because, you know, as, as a journalist for so long, we would put these numbers on the screen, you know, the SAMHSA hotline, you know, if you're feeling suicidal, you know, pick up this number, 1 800 number, and call somebody. And I used to believe in that so much until my own personal experience. Um, in January of 2021, I experienced my first relapse after 12 years of continuous recovery in November of 2020. Uh, the shame, of that relapse is indescribable unless you've ever been through it. Um, I, I had so much shame after that relapse that I didn't even tell my trauma therapist, okay? In January 2021, I sat at the edge of my bed uh, while I was still a news anchor here um, and had a gun in my hand and played Russian roulette. And I wonder, I didn't even pick up the phone and I didn't even call my trauma therapist to let her know that I was at that spot. And as much as I hope that these numbers work, I didn't even call and I didn't even tell somebody. So where, where does that phone number really come in before we get to the point where we're sitting on the edge of the bed saying, I wanna end it all because I don't see a way out because I think when we hit that point, those numbers don't work. And so where do we meet those people? Where do we meet those people and where does this number come in to really help save a life? First of all, I'm so glad you're still here. Thank you. <laughs> um, that, that is the point exactly. So 988 is a tool. These numbers are a tool. They've been around. But what we've been fighting in the behavioral health community is stigma. Right. And stigma is what stopped you from calling your trauma therapist. Because of shame. Stigma is what stops us from telling our loved ones when our depression becomes to a point of danger, when our loneliness, our self-loathing, our guilt yes. um, becomes dangerous for us. As a society, as a community, it is our responsibility together to bring out whatever it is that's us. How uncomfortable is it with you walk into your office in the morning and say, hi, Cheryl, how are you today? And she says, actually, I'm feeling depressed. That is very uncomfortable in our social society. Yes. Why is that? We have so much work to do, and 988 has brought so much attention on a national level to mental health, behavioral health, crisis care, access to services, but none of them work. 
if no one picks up the phone. So it's shows like this, it's interactions with humans, it's taking in the voice of those who have experienced a moment like you did in January, and really trying to make sure that our services are not just available, but are comfortable to reach. So a lot of work to do. This is, uh, I can see, so much more than a job to you. As Brandon's telling his story, which he tells very eloquently, and he made a decision along the way to start telling that story because he's working to break that stigma. Because it, with him, this good-looking guy, news anchor, like he can't have any problems, right? Mm -hmm. And so he's been super courageous in speaking out about that. But I saw you get emotional. I mean, I could tell how much you care about this subject. Absolutely. I've, I've actually lost more than one family member mm -hmm. um, and loved one to suicide. And uh, it's, it's so disheartening. But it is what brings me back to work every single day, to try and find that touch point, to try and find what can we can do to break this stigma so people will reach out. I've had my own struggles in life, and I understand how hard it is. I mean, how can you be the crisis administrator for the whole state right. and suffer from mental health issues? Well, the truth is we all do. We Every all person. Do. <laughs> you'll hear stats like one in five, so on and so oh, forth. But any moment in your life, any decision that you make could result in an internal trauma. And it needs to be OK for us to reach out for help when it does. And the statistics even show that about 80 to 85 percent of all people in their early childhood have experienced some form of trauma. And if we don't heal from that trauma, eventually it's going to come to surface in other ways that we don't even realize that that traumatic ex experience is impacting the way we are currently living. But you are so spot on, and I am so glad you said the reason why people do not pick up the phone is because of societal stigma about us. Because we have lived in this society of saying that don't air your dirty laundry, right? Make the world think that your life is perfect. I mean, we have to shatter the stigma if this is gonna work. If we are gonna save those lives to say it is absolutely okay, to say, I don't want to live anymore, right? Just even that thought, let's, you should be able to share that with somebody and go, man, I just don't even see a way out anymore. 988, it's more than a phone number. It, it is. is the yeah. raising of awareness. It is more federal funding. And it is telling people, this is not, we're not just telling you to call at the moment when something has gone horribly wrong. We're telling you, call this number in any sort of crisis and feel that it is a non-judgmental place. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, again, on a national platform, what 988 has brought, you know, the awareness to the public and the community has been awesome, but also to the behavioral health community. There are so many networking providers across the country. I speak with counterparts in other states multiple times a week because I'm lucky enough to work here in Arizona where we've had a system for a long time. But there are states that don't even have a response system beyond that phone number, right? right? And, and the phone number is a great resource, but we have to have a system. And we have to, most importantly, get people to access that system. Mm -hmm. And they have to feel safe and comfortable to do so. I'm watching this show. This is a national show. You know, people are watching this from all over. We're taping in Arizona, but this is state to state. We're speaking out to everybody. Who would call this number? Anybody in distress. Anyone in distress. There's no wrong time to call 988 or a local crisis number. In Arizona, we have several local crisis numbers. Some of their steps but for specific tribal people, partners and nations. Right. Um, so any crisis line, there's never a bad time to call. I think I might be depressed. It's not a bad time to call to talk to a trained professional to help you get the help you need before it's too late. Well, uh, I, you're doing a tremendous job, yeah, and other states so should be important. so lucky to have someone like you leading a department as important as this. Oh, thank thank you. you so much for coming thank on. You. Thank you, thank guys. You we so appreciate, appreciate it. you very much. Our sunshine story, celebration cakes for foster kids, and this is called uh, For Goodness Cakes. I love this because it allows the community uh, to feel like they're playing a role um, in, in helping children in their own community, and they can actually bake a cake and then that cake will be delivered to these foster families to help them celebrate the foster children that they're raising. Yes, all the professional bakers out there or the ones who are <laughs> maybe not as professional like me, but you just want to do some something jello, to help. You know? So 11,000 plus cakes delivered, 22 chapters, 4,000 volunteers, and f over 500 partner agencies, all bringing a little bit of a 
sugar and sunshine to the foster kids who, who desperately need that love. They absolutely do. And a huge shout out to all the foster moms and dads out there who yes. are doing an incredible job by caring for our children so that they can be raised in a, in a stable home. It's crucial in those early formative years. Absolutely. And we want to thank all of you for joining us for Good Morning Sunshine. Yes, you're watching here on YouTube. You're going to notice, subscribe to our channel. There's a notification bell. Click that notification bell. If you do that, every time we upload an episode, you will be alerted. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you back here for the next episode. Take care, everyone.